Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great honor to address such a prestigious audience. Uh, since the topic is tomorrow, I think I would say a few words about yesterday, a few words about today, and a few words about tomorrow. So if you, if you look back uh, in, in, in very brief words at what happened uh, when this whole crisis started, it started by an unprecedented drama in the financial world, as you know. A large number of banks, and to a lesser extent insurance company, went into very serious trouble. A big bank went bankrupt. Others became f candidate to forced mergers. And quite a lot of banks were saved uh, by government support. Israel, Mr. President, because of the cautiousness of the bankers and the talents of the supervisor, did obviously better than most. I think that unless you're 100 years old and still in activity, one can say that nobody in activity has seen a crisis of this magnitude, and one should never forget this. The financial industry came very close to a collapse and was saved by remarkable actions put in place by central bankers who provided liquidity in a variety of sophisticated forms uh, to, the, to the banking industry and by governments. And the governments obviously had to intervene in various forms, guaranteeing assets, buying assets, and taking stakes in many banks. This whole thing started in the summer uh, of 2007, and I remember in London seeing the interbank market close uh, almost within a night, uh, which m meant that for those who are not bankers, the liquidity uh, that banks used to lend to one another suddenly disappeared. Have banks recovered? I turned to look to the governors. I think one can say globally, yes. Some remain fragile, but I think the situation of banks has, is vastly improved, or has vastly improved. Then the financial crisis was followed uh, by a worldwide recession. And in this recession, although again, some countries did much better than others, one can say that there was no decoupling. Everyone took a bit of the pain, some more than others. As you know, in a recession, you have at least two quarters. In this particular case, we had more than two quarters of negative output. We had a big uh, drop in value of assets. Uh, we had a drop in corporate earnings. We saw massive destocking, massive deleveraging at the corporate level, and of course, massive deleveraging at the consumer, which means that the consumers stopped borrowing and started to rebuild their savings. And of course, when consumers uh, rebuild saving and stop borrowing. It fuels recession, particularly in countries like the US, where the share of GDP coming from consumer spending is very high, and therefore, of course, uh, you can't come back to a more healthy situation and expect to keep uh, economic dynamism. Of course, many jobs were lost, but again, one could have, one could have gone into a severe deflation, which is a tragedy, Everyone has seen how complicated it is. Japan is a good case. When you start to be in a deflation, how you move out of it is extremely difficult. Deflation, again, was avoided by the fact that governments, central banks, in a very concerted and, and, and swift and intelligent reaction, uh, put in place a number of stimulus packages which prevented this recession to transform itself into a major deflation. Now, where are we today? I think today stock markets have, as you know, recovered. There's been a great rally, particularly in the last three months. The question then is, this recovery, is it reflective completely or only partially uh, of the situation of the real economy? And I think it is only partially reflective of the situation of the real economy. There is new equity available, i.e. fresh money, uh, for people who want to raise money, subject to, you know, the story uh, making sense. 
bond markets have reopened, and that segment is, 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 extremely, is extremely active. Credit spreads have improved, and corporate earnings seem to have stabilized. So there are some clearly positive aspects today. But unemployment is still increasing, and I believe that no one can talk of a final recovery while people are still losing their jobs. Now, at the macroeconomic level, what are we seeing today? Again, I'm the layman in that subject. Um, I think the recovery process, contrary to what happened when the recession started, uh, has shown some decoupling. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you take, for instance, China, the shape of the recovery is a V. It's gone down, spent a lot of money, did intelligent things, had a lot of reserves, started with a lot of money, and now is back into growth. Western Europe is probably the shape of an L, and I think we all hope to see the L slowly becoming a U. The question is how long will it be an L and when will it become a U? And of course the fear is that it doesn't become a U but becomes a W, which means that there's another element of, 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 of setback, rightly or wrongly, my own view, because I'm an optimist, President Perez says that optimists and pessimists live the same way, so might as well live as an optimist. Um, I think there will be blips, there will be dents, there will be moments uh, which might be difficult, but there's not going to be a major setback. I in our business, we're still very busy working at helping corporates reshape, restructure their balance sheet, but investments are coming back and we are seeing a modest pickup in the mergers and acquisition market. Not what it was in the first half of 2007, but better than what it was in the last 12 months. Now, tomorrow. Tomorrow is obviously a more, more difficult question. It's easy to analyze the past. It's not so easy to forecast the future. Couple of questions. First of all, behaviors. You know, the common view is that when a crisis is over, one forgets very quickly, and one goes back to one's bad habits. Again, maybe I'm naive, probably am, but I find it hard to believe that business, and particularly in the financial and the banking sector, will not remember what happened. Obviously, banks will have to follow new rules put in place by regulators, but the question is, will all this happen because we are forced, as a, an industry already very regulated, to do things new because regulators have asked us to do things new, or will there be a sort of voluntary change in behavior, and to put it in very simple terms, uh, you know, will people understand that more transparency is needed when it comes to bank, less complexity, maybe a better quality earnings than just a quantity of earnings, and of course, accountability I leave the legal side apart, moral accountability uh, on the part of senior management uh, when it comes to running institutions like bank. The second element of behavior is, of course, that it's fair to say that it's too easy when a crisis of that magnitude starts to be behind us and one sees the world improve. It's, it's too easy to sort of think that we will go quickly back to where we were before. I don't think that is true. So it means that people such as myself and others who work in Western Europe, i.e. in countries where growth uh, will not be as strong as it was in the past, how do you preserve your profit, your level of activity uh, in, in, an, in a changing environment? Well, obviously, you have to accept the idea that you've got to work more, that you probably have to earn less, that you've got to be more imaginative, more innovative, more aggressive, and gain new shares of market. And in, in this exercise of gaining new shares of market, I would like to have Jim's view about new market means investing in emerging markets, and then can one come to a situation where there's a level playing field, i.e. we are open to foreign investment coming in our own countries. Will we be able to offset some of the decline in our activity within our own markets in, in investing in other markets, and will, will we be welcome? That's obviously a question that stems from uh, living in a place where there's less growth. Of course, there's another question, which is not of my competence, but again, 
we may get some answers from the governors, is that the governments have, have avoided, the, 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 again, the crisis becoming a major deflation, and they've put in place a lot of stimulus packages, but the stimulus packages mean that the level of debt in a number of countries uh, is extremely high, and at least in an unprecedented level. So uh, what will countries do? They will probably clamp down on expenses, but there's a limit to how much you can limit public expense. They will increase taxes, unpleasant but probably difficult to avoid. And this will have, a, of course, a negative impact on growth. Now, some people say inflation will sort it out. I don't think inflation is something central bankers enjoy particularly. And I also think that if there was inflation and interest rates have to be risen very rapidly, there would be a collapse in the bond market and this would be very very, very uh, negative because there's a huge amount of bonds outstanding there and the drop in value would have again negative effects. So, you know, quite a few questions ahead of us and I'd like to stop uh, this by just saying two things. One, I think Israel is an example of having weathered the crisis well, is an example of a, of a country that with energy, vitality, uh, willpower, used to overcoming obstacles, has done better, and therefore it's a lesson, you know, for people who might be too complacent or who live in an environment where easy money was too easy. I'd also would like to say something a little bit technical, and I apologize, but when crises like this one occur, things that were love become hated. So leverage buyouts, it's horrible, hedge funds are dramatic, securitization is a horrible word. I, I just would like to leave you with the thought that none of those three elements are as such negative. They're in my view very positive. The problem is use them properly with the right level of risk and with the right pricing. Because as you move into a world where banks will be probably, if not smaller, probably be less leveraged, less gearing, will have to have more capital, then it means that probably macro level, they will lend less than they used to lend in the past. And in order to fuel growth in the world, you need available money to go towards investment and not just stay in saving accounts. Therefore, you need to find ways of having money that is not necessarily coming from banks redirected to investments. And that's why those instruments are essential. The problem again is using them properly. Thank you for your patience.